Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Lakeview webinar series. It's my pleasure today to introduce Susan Sin, who is going to be presenting today on anxiety in adolescence, building a toolbox of coping skills. We're really excited to hear more about this. This is a very popular uh, webinar. We received a tremendous amount of response from folks around the country, so we're excited to hear more from Susan to learn more about um, best practices. She's done a lot of work with positive psychology. Um, she's going to be hoping to interact with you a little bit more on some of the, the mindfulness and meditation, so stay tuned. Um, before we, we get into the workshop itself, I'd like to just share with you about Lakeview Health. For those of you that are new to Lakeview Health, um, we offer these webinar series on a monthly basis. Um, our focus is to provide you with um, real-time, cutting-edge information that will be helpful for you and your practice and working with your clients. Lakeview Health is a Jacksonville-based addiction dual diagnosis treatment program. Uh, we, are, we are focused specifically on inpatient uh, residential treatment. We do have all five levels of care. Um, this slide in particular will share with you um, a little bit about what we believe and who we are. Um, the, the important thing to point out in regards to who we are is that we believe um, in a very strong approach of servant leadership. Um, we carry that culture through our entire organization. We believe that by empowering our staff, they, in fact, have a better chance of helping and supporting our patients and helping our families. Um, we offer a program that is integrative in its approach. It's a holistic approach, a body, mind, and spirit. Um, we look at the entire individual. And we are gender responsive. And so we invite you to learn more about our program at lakeviewhealth.com, um, where we are able to provide you more with a, a walking tour of our campus, uh, specific aspects of our clinical program. You can also meet and learn a little bit more about our clinical team. Just a few housekeeping things to, to make you aware of. Many of you within the hour after this webinar will be receiving an evaluation form. In order for you to receive your, your um, Certificate of completion, you will need to complete that online evaluation form. Um, your, e your certificates will be emailed or, if you prefer, mailed to you. Um, we do have your email address when you register, so we can send that to you directly. Um, please be sure to include your license number when you also uh, move forward with um, submitting that evaluation form, so that way we can go ahead and uh, credit you your CEUs. If you have um, staff or other individuals that are watching with you in your practice and they have not formally registered, we are going to need to know who they are, so please be sure to email Jackie Cream. Um, her email is listed here as well, jcream at lakeviewhealth.com, and she can also make sure to send those certificates. With that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Susan. Um, Susan is a, an, an LCSW who's been a clinical psychotherapist for 25 years. She's earned her master's degree in social work in 1990 from Columbia University. She's conducted numerous workshops and presentations at conferences on topics like stress management, cultural diversity, parenting, and work-life balance. Currently, Susan has the privilege of helping children, adolescents, and adults heal from problems such as stress and anxiety, depression, low self-esteem, relationship issues, parenting concerns, and a phase of life strategies. She works with families and individuals and couples and in groups in, the, in her New York office. She's passionate to inspire and empower people to be their most joyful and compassionate version of themselves. Susan has extensive knowledge of stress management methods, including mind-body techniques such as guided meditation, mindfulness, and EFT. She's eclectic, her eclectic approach incorporates these and other effective therapies with strength-based supportive counseling to help her clients transform limiting beliefs and patterns enabling them to thrive, leading happier, more fulfilling lives. She's also co-founder of Indigo Light Center for Joyful Living and owner at Positive Therapy for You. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and welcome Susan. Um, if you give us a moment, we're going to go ahead and transition her over to her slide deck. Okay, it is not, oh, there we go. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thank you, Gina, so much. Um, and thank you, everyone who is attending. Um, I'm so happy to be presenting on this topic today on anxiety in adolescence. It's, um, it's something near and dear to me. Um, 
As Gina mentioned, I am a social worker. I've been working um, in private practice for um, over 25 years, actually. I started out in an employee assistance program um, where I did receive a lot of training in um, cognitive behavioral therapy, short-term treatment, um, which ties in a, a lot with some of the things I'm going to be talking to you about today. But what I noticed over the past 25 years of working with clients is that I, I did start receiving more and more referrals for adolescents um, who were coming in with severe anxiety issues. And over the past 25 years, my practice has changed. The way I conduct my therapy has uh, changed uh, in, in many ways. And I'll share with you, um, that's what a lot of this presentation is about. Um, a few years ago, a friend of mine approached me, Mary Gonzalez, and she talked to me about doing groups with children. So we decided to put a center together to start running groups, uh, meditation and mindfulness groups, for children and teens to help them deal with anxiety. And so together we have been doing that for the last couple of years, and I'm going to share also some, some of the things that we do in those groups as well. Um, and privately, I do have a, a Facebook page, Positive Therapy for You, and, uh, and uh, I try to share a lot of insights and inspiration on that page. So I do have my clients, they like the page and they really enjoy getting those daily reminders to help them. Um, in addition to being a therapist and working with adolescents, I have a mother of two adolescents myself, a 17-year-old and a 20-year-old. And I am an author. My book that I have written is not out yet. Um, I was hoping it would be out before this presentation, but it isn't. But you can look forward to that in the future, um, hopefully in the next couple of months. So today, the objectives that we're going to talk about are, and that we're going to try to cover, are um, understanding the scope of anxiety in adolescents today, developing skills in teaching mindfulness and meditation to adolescents in both an individual and a group. Um, and developing skills in positive psychology to help adolescents develop resiliency. This is really to supplement what you're already doing. Um, talk therapy is wonderful and he helps um, adolescents incredibly. Supportive um, listening is very significant to them. These are just some other tools that we can share with our clients that I've found very, very helpful. Um, so that's what we're going to be focusing on today. Um, the reason that, that this is such a widespread issue, we, we're talking about children and teens are suffering from more and more stress and anxiety than previous generations. And I hear it consistently from other therapists as well, more and more referrals for anxiety in adolescents. And studies by the American Psychological Association indicate that teens suffer from stress as much as adults do. And that's kind of new. Adults usually um, had higher levels of stress. And now we're finding teens are experiencing as much stress as adults. Um, school is cited as the biggest source of stress. And other sources would be social issues, um, relationship issues, uh, and family issues as well. Uh, twice as many teens indicate that their stress is increasing than those that feel it's decreasing. So over time, these, these teens are not showing that it gets better over time. They're showing that it's getting worse. And so that's why we really need to address these issues. Uh, and what I've found, um, and the research finds, is that there are a lot of maladaptive coping skills. Um, cutting is a very serious problem in US adolescents, uh, according to one uh, statistic, one-third to one-half of U.S. adolescents have engaged in some type of self-injury. Um, and that, uh, I would say, I've seen in my practice as well, even among the older adolescents, and I do consider adolescents up into the 20s, because I find that they're dealing with a lot of adolescent issues in the early and even sometimes mid-20s, um, that older, uh, older adolescents will report that at some point in their younger years, they engaged in cutting or some other type of self-injury. So that's a very serious problem. Alcohol and drugs, of course. Um, the odds of alcohol dependence is two to three times more likely in people with an anxiety disorder, which makes sense because it's considered a coping 
skill. Not a good one, but it is considered a way to cope. And teens with anxiety disorders are also more likely to turn to pot, Xanax, Valium, and sleep aids to deal with their anxiety. And then the other thing that I'm seeing a tremendous amount of um, is anxious avoidance. Uh, avoiding the feared activity such as school or social situations is a very big problem. I am getting lots and lots of referrals for school avoidance. And so teaching children how to cope in a more effective way is so critical today more than ever before. So that's the focus of today's um, session. So some of the things that I want to go over today are um, some useful coping skills are mindfulness. Uh, mindfulness is really the act of bringing your attention to the present moment. Mindfulness training appears to improve attention skills and lower antisocial behavior among incarcerated youth. Um, that's according to a study, but there are so many studies on the benefits of mindfulness. Um, and meditation, uh, 30 minutes of daily meditation may provide as much relief from anxiety and depression symptoms as antidepressants. This is a very widely cited study that meditation can be as effective as medica med medication. So um, teaching ch children and teens how to meditate is really a significant um, uh, skill that they can learn. Uh, another study is on gratitude. N um, numerous studies have shown that the daily practice of gratitude can lead to feeling calmer and happier, not just in the moment, but in the long term. And we're going to talk about all of these things um, in more depth. But uh, I also want to mention that um, on the Indigo Light um, website, um, IntegralLightPath.com, uh, which is uh, the groups that we do, that's that website. Um, there is uh, a section on research, and you can actually get links to more and more research studies. And on the Facebook page for Indigo Light, we're constantly posting stories and, and um, uh, research that's been conducted, because there's a tremendous amount of research being done on meditation in schools, the benefits of meditation with children and teens. So um, I encourage you to check those out as well, or in any other form that you might want to. Um, another skill that I like to teach the people that I work with, and the you know teens and, and younger as well, is the law of attraction. And there's a lot of talk about the law of attraction. Some of you may be familiar with it. Um, law of attraction simply states that whatever you focus on, you get more of. Many, many years ago, this became a very popular. Um, uh, this became very popular after Oprah featured the movie The Secret, which was done by Rhonda Byrne. She had a book by the same name. And Oprah featured her work and the movie on her show, and it became very, very popular. Um, interestingly, at the same time, prior to that, I had been doing a lot of my own reading, and it seemed like consistently, whether I was reading a parenting book or a business book or whatever it happened to be, the, fo the focus of the book was that you know, the more you focus on the positive, the more positive you get. And the more you focus on the negative, the more negative you get. Uh, so I was kind of discovering this at the time, and then that movie came out, and it really hit home with me that this is true. And I had been practicing it and working the secret for a long time in my own life and seeing the benefits. So I also started bringing that into my practice with all of my clients, um, you know, even the younger ones, and definitely the adolescents and adults. Um, teaching them to develop an understanding of the law of attraction can really help them create a calmer and happier life now and in the future. Because what it does is it gives them a sense of control over their own futures. A lot of times, you know, children feel out of control. They feel like everything is decided for them, and they don't feel that sense of control over their lives. And that can lead to not only anxiety, but also depression. So teaching children about this law can be very, very powerful. And I've seen it in my practice. I've seen the way the, the, you know, the kids respond to it. So we're going to talk more about that as well. Um, other coping skills that we want to work on is the power of words and thoughts. Um, there is a scientist, Masaru Emoto, 
who conducted a series of water experiments to show how words or the intention of those words affect us and others. So one of the studies that he had done, um, I'm going to show you later, but one of the other studies he did was he took beakers of water and put words on each of the beakers. And then he froze the water and he sliced it and studied it under a microscope. And what he found, interestingly, was that every single word had its own crystalline structure. So that's pretty powerful. So we're going to talk more about that later, but um, these are interesting things to share with your clients and let them know about the power of words. So tied in with that power of words is um, affirmations and how to use them. We're going to also talk about that and the power of joy. So we're going to talk about these things later as well. Okay, um, mindfulness in practice. One of the first things that we want to um, understand and teach when we're talking about mindfulness is about being in the present moment. And before you can do that, it's kind of important to be centered and to feel, you know, to be able to be aware of where you are in the present moment. And the way to teach that is through mindful breathing. And that is the focus on the breath. So I'm, you can all do this right now. Just take a deep breath. I want you to feel the sensation of breathing in slowly and breathing out slowly. And just notice if the air is cool or warm. Just focus on that breath. You can breathe in through the nose to a count of four. And exhale through the nose to a count of four. And the other thing that you can do is put one hand on your belly and one on your chest so you can feel the air fill your belly. Many people do not breathe properly. And when you're stressed, there's a tendency to breathe very shallow or to hold your breath. So practicing mindful breathing throughout the day can help you stay calm not only in the moment, but it can, can extend throughout the day. So teaching, um, teaching our young people how to do this is very powerful. Um, I teach all of my clients breathing. I, you know, anybody that comes in with an anxiety issue, I, one of the first things I do is I teach them how to breathe properly um, it, because it's the simplest thing that you can do anywhere. And take that with you wherever you go. And it's a, a very powerful way to calm yourself. And it calms both the body and the mind which is also significant. Um, one of the things that we do in our groups, um, Mary and I um, have the groups with the children. We have young children and, and teens. And all of them, even the teens, are, you know, really enjoy this. We have a bag of, of uh, Beanie Babies, little stuffed animals that are filled with beans. And we have them lie down with the stuffed animal on their belly. And they watch as the animal rises and falls. And this is a way for them to visually see the stomach rising and falling so they know they're breathing in deep and not breathing shallow. So um, the Breathing Buddies is a really fun way to teach a breathing technique, and I encourage that as well. And even in my office when I have young people, I'll tell them to lie down. I have a couch. I'll tell them to lie down on the couch, and I give them a stuffed animal and let them practice their breathing for a little bit. So that's one way to just kind of make it fun for younger people. Uh, another, these are some other ways that we use mindfulness in practice. Um, coloring books and mandalas are huge now among adults and children. And there, there's a good reason for that. It's because the, the practice of coloring in a coloring book is very meditative. It's a form of meditation in and of itself. So it is, you're being very mindful as you choose the colors and as you color. So um, even in my office, I have um, coloring sheets that I printed up, and I leave those in the waiting room, either for the young people that are waiting with a parent in the other room, or while they're waiting for their session to start, I you know give them some coloring books and mandalas to work on. And that's another way to just kind of bring that in and something that they can do at home. Um, walking in nature is a very powerful, mindful uh, technique. Um, another study by the American Psychological Association says taking a break from technology and immersing yourself in nature may improve cre creativity. 
And I always say, I don't really need a study to tell me that walking in nature is good for me. I know that it is. When I go out and I'm walking in nature, I am present. And I focus on the smells and the, and the sounds of, you know, at this time of year, the sounds of the leaves crumbling under your feet and the colors of the leaves and, the, you know, the scents, the sounds, everything. And so as you teach children to do that, uh, they are learning to kind of pause in the day. They're learning to take a moment to notice what's around them instead of being so um, focused on the future because we know that anxiety is very future focused. So walking in nature and being present while you're walking is a very powerful mindful technique. Um, in our groups, we also use um, chocolate kiss exercise which is very simply, and it's the, one of the first ones we do with them because they really like it. Um, we have them feel the chocolate kiss in the wrapper, and then they unwrap it, and then they feel the smoothness of the chocolate kiss, and they smell it, and we just kind of have them go through their senses with it, and then they put it in their mouths, and we tell them not to chew it, to just kind of allow it to dissolve a little bit and to focus on the, the taste and where they feel it in their mouths and where they taste it. Um, and that's a very good mindful eating technique. I've heard it also done with raisins. Um, I tr we, we did a presentation at a library and we used raisins because we weren't sure about chocolate, you know, allergies. And they didn't really like the raisin as much. <laughs> so um, they definitely like the chocolate kiss a little bit better. Uh, okay, Watch it, watching fish in an aquarium is, of course, very mindful as you're focused on that. Washing your hands mindfully. I really like recommending this because it's something that you do several times a day. And I like to have my clients know to put in something in practice that they do repetitively. And so every time, I say every time you wash your hands, focus on the sensation of the water. What is the temperature? How does the lather feel? Um, what does the soap smell like? So being present just for those couple of seconds that you're washing your hands or that minute that you're wash, washing your hands, if you do that every time, it's that pause during the day that helps you to relax a little bit. So I think that's a good one. With adults, I'll tell them when they're driving, every time they stop at a stoplight to take three deep breaths or something that can be a routine where they learn to incorporate something in their day. That's very powerful. Um, and also blowing bubbles slowly. Um, I've always been a big fan of bubbles. When my kids were young, I was never without bubbles in my house. And blowing bubbles slowly is a very um, relaxing technique. And it teaches proper breathing because you're breathing out slow. So we have them breathe in and then slowly breathe out into the bubble. And that can be um, another wonderful mindful technique. Of course, meditation, um, pr practicing meditation proven to reduce stress and anxiety. I can't even list the number of studies that have been done on meditation in children and teens. Uh, you know, I can tell you that they love it. They will practice it. So thinking that they're, they're not going to be interested or they're not going to want to do it is a mistake. They really do enjoy the meditations. Um, I find that guided meditations on YouTube or even apps for my clients. They will, they will download an app in my office. They'll find one that they like and they'll practice it. And it's a way, especially my very anxious adolescents that I work with, they really like the app because they always have it with them and it's easy to access. So I encourage them to download an app like that. In the groups that we do, um, Mary and I write our own meditations and we read them um, and have the kids do them. In the uh, in the group, so that's uh, um, meditation is definitely an important thing to do. Guided meditations tend to be easier because it gives you something to focus on. Um, having a child sit quietly and you know for a f you know more than a few minutes may be a, a you know a tough call to do. So starting with guided meditations is uh, is definitely a good way to start them and to get them involved and. And even starting them small, like a really short meditation, maybe like a five-minute meditation, and then moving up to longer meditations is a great way to get them really into it. Um, another meditation that I recommend for my clients is the deep muscle relaxation 
Um, the deep muscle relaxation, it's also called the progressive relaxation. You start from your toes and you tighten the muscles and you work your way up to your, um, to your face. So there are a lot of uh, deep muscle relaxations that you can listen to online also. And that's a great one for bedtime because it really relaxes your muscles. You're tightening them and once you relax them, you find a deeper state of relaxation. So that a lot of my clients will use that at nighttime when they're having trouble sleeping. And then the last one that I wanted to mention is the meta meditation, which is a loving kindness meditation. And I am going to talk about that a little bit more later. And if I have time, I will do a quick um, version of that for you guys. Gratitude. The single most important skill any anybody, any child, teen, adult can learn to lead a happier life, in my opinion, is learning to practice gratitude. Um, there are numerous studies on the power of gratitude. And uh, one of them that I know that was done um, on gratitude, the connection of gratitude and happiness, they had people write for two weeks. They had them write um, three things that they were grateful for, or three things that went well during the day, and why. And at the end of the two weeks, the people that did that showed a much higher level of happiness than the control group, which did not do that. Um, and that's pretty powerful in and of itself, but even more powerful is that six months later, they tested these people again. The control group showed no increase in happiness, and the people that did the gratitude work for two weeks, only those two weeks, continued to show higher levels of happiness after six months. So I like to cite that study to my clients to get them motivated to um, practice gratitude because everybody wants to be happier. So um, that's a pretty powerful study. Another, and the way they can do this is in a variety of ways. The gratitude journal, looking for three things every day. And again, it's important that they're looking for three things to be grateful for. Another study showed no improvement in happiness levels when they did this study initially because they found that the people were writing the same thing every day. I'm grateful for my health, I'm grateful for my family, whatever it happened to be. So it's very important that you're looking, you're searching for things to be grateful for each day. So a journal is a great way to do that. I have been keeping gratitude journals for I can't even tell you how many years. Um, every now and then I don't. When I'm going through a difficult time, I tend to go right back to it because that's when I need it the most. Um, another another uh, tool is using a gratitude rock. And you could even have children decorate a rock or choose a rock in the, you know, at the beach, find a rock that they like that feels good in their hands. This was mentioned in The Secret, um, the secret movie many years ago. And at that time, I grabbed a rock and I was going through a difficult time, put the rock in my pocket of my coat. And the person in the, in the movie said that he would pull the rock out at the end of the day and he would remember to think of three things he was grateful for during the day. I used it a little differently. I had it in my coat pocket and every time I reached into the pocket and felt it, felt it I would um, think about something to be grateful for. So throughout the day, I was using that as a tangible reminder that I needed to be grateful. Um, another tool is um, the gratitude jar and bowl, something else I've done. <laughs> uh, many years ago, I was interested in feng shui, um, and I remember reading that you know, keeping a bowl in the center of your home and writing on slips of paper things you're grateful for was a good way to bring goodness into your life. And so um, I got a nice bowl. I think they mentioned that it should be yellow or some other color. I had a yellow bowl. So I put it in what I thought was the center of my house. I have an L-shaped ranch, so that was a tough one, but I put it wherever I thought the middle might be, and I started doing that. And the other thing, my kids really got into it. They were much younger at the time, and they got really into it. Um, I told them that you could also put things that you wanted in your life. So almost like that future gratitude. So they got really into that. They, I'd find a lot of paper in that bowl of things that they really wanted in their lives, um, you know, whether it was a Lego set for my son or later a guitar for him or for my daughter, it was, you know, a boyfriend or whatever it might have been. So in any case, um, 
that is a really good tool as well. And I've, I've used all of these things. I don't um, recommend things that I haven't tried myself. The power of words. As I said earlier with the Masaru Emoto's uh, experiments that he did, different words have different frequencies. And they do affect us. So it's important to teach uh, teens to be aware of how they speak to themselves because negative self-talk is so damaging. So um, this, is, uh, this experiment is something that I've shown my clients, you know, young and old, and we have shown the kids in our groups the experiment. It's called the Rice Experiment, and I'm going to actually play it for you right now. It's pretty short, so it won't take too long. It's just loading. Um, but we had some kids in the group go home and actually replicate the experiment, um, which was uh, pretty cool. And they actually had the same results. So uh, it's taking a little longer than I would expect. There we go. Dr. Emoto has conducted another interesting experiment. Uh-oh. Sorry. I'm sorry, I'm just trying to adjust the sound here. Let me just go back. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Let's try this again. It's just buffering. This is what happens when you have an old computer. <laughs> and covered it with water. He put and rice in the jars. Thank you to one beaker. You're an idiot to the second. And the third one, he completely ignored. After one month, the rice that had been thanked began to ferment, giving off a strong, pleasant aroma. The rice in the second beaker turned black. And the rice that was ignored began to rot. OK, that's all we're going to show of that. Um, that's the experiment that he did. And this experiment has been replicated in classrooms where they put um, I love you or thank you on one beaker, I hate you or you're an idiot on another, and the third one they ignored. And in a classroom they had the students walk past the beakers and do exactly what it said on the glass over the course of a month. So this was being done periodically and the results were the same. They still had the same results of the first beaker um, giving off the nice aroma and the other two either rotting or turning black. And I actually did this experiment in my own house and had the same results. But we had a young girl in one of our groups who immediately went home the day we showed her this. And she um, actually was very excited to repeat the experiment. So, and she found the same results with, uh, with that. So that's pretty powerful. That, talks, that speaks to us about the way our words impact us and others. Um, so with these anxious kids, we really focus on the way they're talking to themselves. Um, if I was doing this more globally in a classroom, I would discuss about the way you affect your words affect other people as well, because um, that's also significant. And for parents as well, how they talk to their children. Um, but for anxious adolescents, the focus is really on the words they use for themselves. So that's a powerful experiment. And that ties nicely in with using affirmations. So affirmations, as we know, are present tense. They're positive. They're detailed and specific. Some examples are, I am smart and capable. I understand difficult concepts. I am worthy of love and kindness. Those are some really good um, positive affirmations. Uh, I actually had a client at one time, a young girl named Amanda. And I was going over this um, concept of her. And I was writing down some affirmations. And I wrote down the affirmation, I am worthy. And I gave it to her on an index card to take home and to use that as an affirmation. Because she was struggling with some worthiness issues. Um, and interestingly enough, when I gave it to her, she said, you know, that's what my name means. 
I said, what do you mean? She said, Amanda means worthy. So I said, well then, Amanda, every time you say, I am Amanda, you are saying, I am worthy. And it was pretty, she loved that. It was very powerful to her and very meaningful. And so she really did use that affirmation quite a bit. Some bad examples of affirmations are, I never fail, I can't lose, and I will pass my test. Um, of course, we don't want to talk about failing or losing in an affirmation. We want to talk about doing well. So those two definitely are no good. Even the I will pass my test, although it's better, it's future focused. So you want to really stay in the present with, a, with an affirmation. The ways that um, I teach um, all my clients to use affirmations is writing them in a journal. Um, I find that adolescents really like using their phones for them, so they'll put, put it in the notes section on their phone and they'll use the affirmations that way, or putting them on sticky notes. A lot of the young people get into this a lot. They are on Tumblr and Instagram and they love having these positive phrases, so they use that a lot. And they'll put them on a post-it note and put it around their house. And that's a great way to remind them um, of what they're trying to focus on. Um, also saying them aloud, so not just reading them, but saying, al saying them aloud and feeling the feeling of the affirmation. Feeling the affirmation amplifies its power. So as they say these things, I tell them to really imagine what it is that they're saying and imagine it as though it's so. So that's a, a very powerful technique. And they can do it in front of a mirror. They can do it um, you know, as they're just reading it. A lot of times they'll put affirmations, the sticky notes, on a mirror in the bathroom and say it aloud in the bathroom because nobody's around and it's easier and less self-conscious that way. Um, and also using affirmations to counter negative self-talk, so challenging the negative messages that they're getting. Okay. In therapy, I feel that joy is the goal. We want our clients to experience more joy. And adolescents are overwhelmed with responsibilities and other people's expectations, especially today. So teaching them to find the things that bring them joy um, and learning how to experience joy in simple ways is very crucial to their well-being um, and to their, their level of happiness. So, um, so I really work with them a lot on finding things that make them happy. A lot of times they can't think of things. Um, I'll say, you know, what do you like to do? And they can't even always think of things. So that becomes my work with them, figuring out things that they like to do and helping them to learn to focus on those little things. Um, you know, walking in nature, doing, you know, the little taking pictures, whatever it may be that makes them happy. So that becomes the work. Um, and because joy really is an antidote to anxiety, when you're feeling joyful, you're not feeling anxious. So finding ways to build that into your day is very, very significant. Um, as I just said, so tapping into their joy through mindfulness, meditation, and gratitude does provide protection from anxiety. Um, anxiety is fear and future-based. What if? What if this happens? What if I fail my test? What if nobody talks to me at the lunch table? That's what anxiety is focused on. But joy is present-based, living in and appreciating the present moment. So teaching them to do that at a young age is extremely powerful and can really protect them from um, anxiety in the future. And back to the law of attraction. <laughs> So law of attraction, I think, ties in very nicely with cognitive behavioral therapy um, because it talks about thoughts creating feelings. So it's not an event that causes the feeling that you're having. It's the thought you have about that event that creates that feeling. And that's what I always you know, worked with when I was doing cognitive behavioral therapy with my clients. And I feel like law of attraction kind of pushes it to the next level almost. So feelings attract similar feelings and thoughts. So I always tell them to reach for the better feeling thought and start general. Um, if you aren't familiar with the law of attraction, um, the work of Abraham Hicks, the work of Rhonda Byrne, these are great ways to start to learn about it. Um, but the idea is that you want to start with something simple. So when somebody is very overwhelmed, it's hard to find something really great, a really great thought. So they can start with, 
well, maybe it won't be as bad as I think it's going to be, and then move to the next thought of, you know, maybe it'll actually be okay, Me and moving on from there. So you start very general and start small, and then that thought can help lead you to the next positive thought, and that's what you want to do. That's what we want to focus on with them. Like attracts like. So I tell this to my clients all the time. If you choose to focus on all the bad in your life, you will be surely given more bad to focus on. Um, and we've seen this happen when somebody wakes up and stubs their toe and they're like, oh, it's going to be one of those days. And then, you know, they're stuck in traffic or they're, you know, they're late for school, whatever it may be. Now that's another reason why it's going to be a bad day. And it goes from there. But if we rewind and we start that day with the stub toe and we say, oh, what a pain in the neck, but I'm not going to let this interfere with my day. You know, let me focus on the good that's going to happen today. You are definitely going to have a happier life. So teaching about that, about, you know, like attracts like, focusing on, focusing on the good in your life will lead you to more good without question. Another fun thing to do with them, as I'm teaching about the law of attraction, I, you know, this is not something that I thought up on my own. This is Rhonda Byrne in The Power, talks about testing the law by thinking about something that they don't normally see that they like. So it could be a blue butterfly, a yellow rose, an orange car, whatever it may be. And you tell them that they're gonna, it's going to show up in their lives in the next day or so. They shouldn't be searching it out. It'll come to them. And I've done this with clients of all ages, and inevitably it works. It always, and they always come back telling me that they saw that thing, whatever it happened to be. I had a young, um, a young girl, about 18, who um, I was talking to her about this, and she said, I want to see orange sneakers. And I said, okay, orange sneakers it is. And she was very anxious and actually was afraid to focus on it or think about it, she said, no, never mind. I, I don't want to see the orange sneakers because I, I don't know if I'm going to see those. I want to think of something else. Well, within that day, she actually saw the orange sneakers. And so even though she tried to discount it, they showed up anyway. And then that motivated her to try again. That motivated her to um, you know, test it out even more. Um, I've had a lot of success with those, with those things. Um, so they are intrigued, and it may show up in other surprising ways. Um, I often ask my clients, if I could wave a magic wand and tomorrow you would wake up living the life of your dreams, what would it look like? I've been doing this since I started in the EAP. Um, it's a technique in short-term uh, solution-focused therapy, and I continue to do that today. It's also tied in with the law of attraction, and I have a lot of um, great stories about how that has been successful. Um, and tied in with the same thing is the other thing that you can do is have them write a thank you letter to the universe or just a narrative describing the life they want in the present tense. Um, the more descriptive, the better. Have them describe what it feels like to have this life. I'm super excited to have a group of friends to hang out with that I'm comfortable with. I'm so confident in my ability to do well in school. I feel so relaxed and calm. And I have done this myself, and inevitably the results are that I, I look back on these letters, and it has always come true to a T. So I encourage those letters a lot, and my clients have uh, come in with tremendous stories about um, how that's worked for them. Um, I know we don't have a whole lot of time, but I wanted to uh, just go over how to get buy-in on these ideas, how to get my adolescents to believe these things is by citing research, um, using the, the Rice experiment, telling stories about uh, doubters that got turned around, other people that you know, didn't believe in this, and then it worked for them. Um, I say, you know, what do you have to lose? I encourage them to just try it out and see how it works for them. Nothing's working, so just try. Why not? And the other thing is I say, you know, I see it differently for you. When my clients think that this is how other people, other people's lives work and not for them and that stuff works for everybody else, I try to see it for them. And I tell them, you know, I don't know. I, if you can't visualize a better life, I, I can. I see you um, being really happy in school. I see you with lots of friends. You're so intelligent and you're so 
fun to be around and I enjoy being with you, I can't imagine that that's not going to happen for you as well. And so I visualize it for them out loud. And that creates a cognitive shift for them. Um, regarding the groups that Mary and I do, um, we do them through Indigo Light. We do a lot of the things we talked about. We do mindful activities, meditation, movement, um, a mindful craft. You can see in the picture is there's um, balloon. They're building with balloons. We had them working together to do that. We had them playing with spaghetti and marshmallows and building stuff as a mindful activity. And they had a lot of fun with that. Um, this is a walking path a labyrinth nearby. We did a field trip there. And they did um, a nice uh, walking meditation there. Um, and we always end every group with the meta meditation. And we find that the, the adolescents really welcome the stress relief. They love these meditations. They're engaged in the discussion. And they really support each other. Um, and they find that it helps them deal with school and social situations. So to them, these groups have been, been like a lifeline. And they really find a lot of support from it. And they report, and their parents report, that they're calmer and happier. And they've said it helps them get through the, the week. So that's a great way to um, kind of get them excited about it by making it fun. And the last major thing I want to talk about is just teaching them to have hope. Um, the antidote to fear is hope. Fear can't reside where hope lives. So it's really important for them to find that little spark that things might not turn out all bad. It's the little voice that says, you know, maybe it'll be OK. Maybe I won't fail this test. Maybe I will find a friend this year. So I really try to you know, help them find that little spark of hope, because um, it's really important. And the, uh, also to let them know, you know, we don't always know what's coming. In the midst of the struggles of life, we forget that it's not the end of the road. So when they're going through a difficult time, I try to explain that this is just where they are at this point. But down the road, they're going to look back. And you know, it's this, this thing that they're dealing with is going to be over. So many times, the good that comes to us can only come about as a result of the struggle we suffered before. They made a friend, or they you know, ended up in a different class where they really enjoyed the teacher. Something may happen as the result of a struggle that they're having that turns it around and makes it really good. So I like them to focus on that hope, and that's very important. Um, so I tell them, instead of imagining the worst, Instead of imagining a worst case scenario, imagine the best. Imagine the best case scenario. And that is also creating a cognitive shift. Every time they do that and they bring their mind into that place, they start doing better. They start feeling better. So um, those are the main things. These are things I'm not going to cover, but I wanted to just mention. Um, I do um, um, EFT, which is a whole course in and of itself, but it's very easy to learn. You could literally look on YouTube and watch a video of it, and you could teach it to your clients. It's very powerful in alleviating um, stress and anxiety. Um, it's actually, a, uh, you tap on meridian points of the body, and it helps release the stress. Um, I recommend Epsom salt baths to my clients with a lot of anxiety. Um, the magnesium in the Epsom salts really helps to relax them. It's not just relaxing the muscles. It relaxes them. And they enjoy that also. Um, exercise is, of course, a recommendation for anybody with anxiety. And Qigong um, is, an, is an exercise that is um, excellent for stress reduction. You can check on YouTube for Lee Holden. He does 10-minute morning and 10-minute evening rituals. And we've done that in the group. I, do, I recommend it to my clients. And they go home and they do it. So that's another great tool for, for your clients to have at home, because that's what we want. We want them to. Um, be able to have those skills. So Gina, do we have questions? Or sh I, I, I don't think I'm going to be able to do the um, meta, because I don't think we I have, have um, We currently have one question. Um, we can okay. ask it now. Or if you want to go ahead and do your um, exercise, we can do that. We have a little bit of time. OK. All right. I'm going to, a meta meditation uh, is, um, it allows you to connect with yourself and others. It helps you let go of resentments and unforgiveness. Um, you're sending love to yourself and others. You always start with yourself, because you can't give what you don't have. 
And many people will experience shifts in relationships after doing this. When we've done this in our groups of, with the kids, um, we have heard stories of bullying that ended and relationships that have improved. And from adults and children, we've heard really positive results. So if everybody could just um, close their eyes, this is going to be pretty short, um, and just imagine a ball of white light circling in your heart. And imagine that this is the light of love. And normally I'd say to repeat these out loud, but you might be in a public place and not want to do that. Um, so you could just think these to yourself. But you're going to start directing these phrases to yourself. So you're going to say and repeat after me, may I be happy. May I be healthy and strong. May my life be filled with ease. Now you're going to direct the meta towards someone you feel thankful for. So picture this person in your mind and imagine that white light going from your heart to theirs and now direct it to them. May you be happy. May you be healthy and strong. And may your life be filled with ease. And now think of somebody that you're, you don't know very well. It could be a mail carrier. It could be somebody in your office that you don't know. And picture them in your mind. And again, imagine that white light going from your heart to theirs. May you be happy. May you be healthy and strong. May your life be filled with ease. Now if you can imagine somebody that you're struggling with, it could be somebody that you're having a hard time with at work, it could be a family member, and again, picture them in your mind and imagine the white light from your heart to theirs. May you be happy. May you be healthy and strong. May your life be filled with ease. And now we're just going to direct it to all beings in the universe. We could certainly use more love being spread out in the universe today. So now imagine the white light spreading from your heart across the universe. May all beings everywhere be happy. May all beings everywhere be healthy and strong. May all beings everywhere have a life filled with ease. And that's the meta. And that's it. So I can take any questions if we have time for them. Thank you, Susan. Um, so we do have a couple of questions. And I'm going to invite those that are still on the call to, if you have additional questions, feel free to type in. Um, we have a question from someone, I think his name is Nike, from DC. Um, he asks, have you found, it, is there a difference in how your clients respond to guided meditation versus meditation that is not guided? That's a great question. Um, I find that the guided meditations are easier for beginner meditators. So if I, if I ask a client who's anxious to try and sit still and do um, you know, a silent meditation, it causes them too much anxiety. So for an experienced meditator and somebody who's able to be, um, to center themselves in that way, that uh, other types of meditation are great. But for somebody who's particularly anxious, um, guided meditations is just, it gives their mind something to focus on. And I also, um, I'm glad you brought that up. I always say, and we always say in the group, it's okay if your mind wanders. You know, as you're listening to the meditation, it's okay if your mind wanders and you're hearing the sounds outside or you're thinking about something that happened today. It's okay. Just, you know, notice it, allow it, and then go back to focusing on the meditation. But having something to listen to and something to imagine makes it easier to stay focused in a meditation. 
Great. Um, we also have a question from Jeffrey who was asking, um, he needed some clarification. Um, at the earlier part of the presentation, it was stated that you encourage your clients to think of the, not to think of the future. Um, oh wait, you initially stated that you do not encourage your clients to think of future. I'll pass the test. But then you tell your clients to imagine a positive future that seems to be at odds. <laughs> yeah, that is. It's very confusing. Um, it's not that they shouldn't, um, they shouldn't ever think about the future. It's the worrying thoughts about the future that can be damaging. So somebody that can be in a positive place of imagining the future, um, that's fine. It's just that a lot of anxiety is future focused. That's what anxiety is about. So I encourage them, so being present, and you're not going to be present 100% of the time. Um, it's fine to think about the future, and I think it's great to have um, goals and intentions, and all of those things are great. That's not the problem. The problem is when your future focus is worry about the future. Then you need to bring yourself back to the present and be present where you are, and then when you're able to think about the future in a positive way, then you can move forward. So it is, it is conflicting, and I've I've heard that before. Um, it is very confusing. As people get involved in it more, they, they start to learn the difference. So, um, but that's a great question. Um, so it is. It's, you want to do both. You want to focus on the future in a positive way, and you want to spend some time being present in the present moment. You're not going to do that 24 hours a day, but practicing being present throughout the day allows you to be calmer. That's where the calmness comes, comes from. Mm, that makes sense. Um, Hallie, um, more of a statement than a question. She says, I love what you have shared, and I do a lot of, these, of this work as well. I found that with younger generations, having them use the audio recording feature on their phones, we will record our own guided sessions or even have them repeat their affirmations out loud on this forum. It just takes a pair of headphones, and they can listen any time they need to. It makes, very, it makes it very accessible and personal at the same time. That is a wonderful idea. I love that idea, actually. Um, we did something very similar to that in the group where we had, um, we actually had the kids in the group, there was an app for making your own rap song or something. And so we had them make a rap with positive affirmations. And they all saved it. They recorded it and saved it. And they listened to the rap. But I love that idea. Of um, of you know being able to hear yourself say it, so that is a, that's a wonderful. Thank you for the tip. That's a great great tip. Um, hearing themselves say that is terrific. I think that that wraps up all of our questions at this point. Um, for those of you that are um, interested in the slide deck, it will be made available to you. Um, we are going to be emailing out the evaluation form within the hour, and then either today or tomorrow, you should receive a follow-up email with the slide deck included. Um, we want to thank Susan again for your time. The information was just tremendously beneficial. I learned a great deal. I have a 14-year-old, and I know that I can certainly apply a lot of these strategies with him. And uh, for those of you that are interested, we are going to be holding um, our next workshop on November 16th for our webinar series, and it's going to be on family systems. And so we'll be looking out for that, for that email. So thank you again, Susan, for your time. Thank you so much. You. Thank you so much, Gina. And thank, thank you, everyone. Bye -bye. <laughs> okay, bye-bye.